recording. Sure. All right, you guys should see a solid work screen. Hopefully that all looks good. Um, yeah, so welcome to the 3D printing and first article, <clears throat> first article inspection workshop. The uh, goal for today is to um, outline best practices for 3D printing and designing for 3D printing specifically, rather than so much the process of actually doing the printing itself. Um, and then, you know, as part of that design, we're going to dive into first article inspections and how to inspect um, parts as they come off the printer and make sure that everything is uh, pretty much you know, good to go. That the part that comes off the printer is the same or within tolerance of the part that you designed. So in order to do this, um, what I figured is we'd go through or I'll go through and I'll design a part for the team, for the uh, for the tube notcher itself. Um, it will be a leveling, um, will be a, a leveling foot. So it's going to have an adjustable um, you know, screw that can screw in and adjust the level of the overall tube notcher. You can space out one on each corner and then kind of square everything out. Um, so that's the goal of what we're designing. <clears throat> oh, geez. That's that's the goal of what we're designing today. And through that, we'll be able to um, look in depth at a lot of the things that we need to keep in mind as we're actually designing these parts. So, <clears throat> um, and kind of to give a little bit of background as well, the, the this workshop will assume that you have at least a cursory understanding of what 3D printing is, um, as well as a rough idea of how to uh, work within SOLIDWORKS. Um, so, yeah, keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you need more help with SOLIDWORKS or you're still learning SOLIDWORKS, feel free to watch my series on SOLIDWORKS uh, or Solid Wednesdays that I did a few years ago. Um, if you need more info on 3D printing, we should have a 3D printing workshop, uh, a previous one up in the drive as well that kind of goes into some of the more basics, uh, uh, more basic aspects of it as well. That being said, let's dive right in. Let's make a new part. Um, And actually, let me, let me preface this by opening up MS Paint. It's usually a good idea to have, you know, I have a good idea in my head of what I'm going to be designing, um, but it's usually a good idea to start to think about some things um, at the very conceptual level, maybe on a whiteboard or on a piece of paper. So the goal for this today, uh, for this part that I'm designing, is we're going to have some 40-40 aluminum section. Uh, so it's 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters. It's uh, kind of rough sketch here. Something like that. And this is what the chassis jig is made up of. Um, and then, you know, it has this rail on the inside where we can mount stuff using T nuts. Um, the reason they're called T nuts is because the extrusion kind of looks kind of like a T in there. It's like a, also hammerhead nuts is another um, term that's used. So this kind of goes down along that way. Um, so what we need to design, it's going to be this this foot that comes out. You know, we're going to actually have to have um, some kind of bolt that's going to go through here. Um, it's going to, you know, we might get around to designing a little foot for it as well, something on the bottom. Um, and then this needs to somehow be attached as well to this 4040 aluminum extrusion. So it'll probably come out, have some kind of, wow, that's garbage. Um, probably have some kind of you know, round shape, maybe hold, uh, I have an idea to hold a nut in there as well um, to carry the load. 10 out of 10 MS Paint skills, I know, but this is kind of what we're working with. So we're gonna be designing this kind of bracket shape. Um, and it'll kind of have something that looks like that as well. Again, there will be a nut that will fit in there to take the load and uh, you know, we'll use a bolt for the this red part here. Um, so this will be a, a threaded, uh, most likely a half inch size bolt is what I'm gonna go with. Um, one of the other things that I'm going to do is I'm going to integrate, um, let me see if I can get the right one here. Oh, that's the wrong one. 
Oh, that is the right one. Never mind. So I have these little circular um, level inserts that we can use as well um, so that we don't actually have to rely on an external level that people keep dropping at our work days. Um, and rather, it will just be an integrated little bubble level. Um, so we'll measure the diameter of this and make sure to dimension things properly. Um, and that'll sit towards the top. So that'll kind of, this kind of gives you a good overview of what this, uh, what this project is. Um, <coughs> uh, yeah, so, so kind of having this idea in mind, we can start to think about, uh, before we even jump into SolidWorks, what approach do we want to use? Uh, so one of the things to remember is that, you know, as we're printing these parts, they're getting laid down in layers. So this is one of the first important things. So we have our build plate here. Um, I guess I should just draw a flat piece. There we go. So we have our build plate. We're laying stuff down on top of this in layers. I'm stacking them up pretty quickly. Um, and the thing to keep in mind is that within the plane, your strength is better because you're extruding con continuous lengths of plastic um, versus out of plane where you're uh, relying on a layer that's been cooled already, then another hot layer being laid down on top of it. And that bond between those two layers um, tends to be a weaker than in plane. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Um, another thing to keep in mind is also uh, the ability to print things. So if you have a big flat surface, that's usually good to align with the build plate. Slap that on there. You don't have to uh, worry about support material. Um, and support material, especially with uh, materials like ABS, tends to be more problematic because uh, ABS tends to warp as well. Um, doesn't do well with bridging. So if you have to, you, know, you have some geometry like this that you have to make covering this in a layer doesn't really do very well, uh, or ABS doesn't do that very well, and then the surface finish doesn't look too good either. Um, so that being said, um, we can choose a couple of different ways to orient this part. Um, and we'll go through the three main ones um, really quickly before we jump into the design. Uh, so the first way to do it is to design our part like this. So again, this kind of assumes that our build plate, it, or, or we're looking from the side, kind of like we were doing up here. Um, design a part like this and print it that way. So we'll have some kind of hexagonal hole here for a nut to go in. Um, we'll have some through holes going down here. Something like that. One of the other things that's uh, good practice when working with aluminum extrusions, for example, is adding some kind of locating boss. So from the side view, if we're looking at this part, um, it would kind of have this little thing that sticks out and rides within this inner channel here. Uh, that helps locate it uh, and center it on this rail. And that's something that's going to be important for this because we're trying to find how level this piece is using this orange piece here. So we have to have an, that interface be pretty sturdy, pretty stable, and also um, you know, not have that interface be able to move around um, and keep those two things parallel. So in this case, we have this big flat area underneath that's going to have to be supported. Um, so this might not be the best way to go. Um, you know, if, this, if there's support material that's being built up here, the quality of this layer here, this mating face essentially, is not going to be very good, um, and you know there's a good chance that these corners will warp because the adhesion. You know there's a little tiny air gap between your support material um, and the actual model material, so there's less adhesion there. The warping will be accentuated. Um, the other option potentially would be to make this little boss removable um, and add that in later on. That's a potential. Um, and designing the part that way would mean that we have this big flat surface and we can make sure that if we have good bed, you know, a good bed adhesion solution um, that this part doesn't warp and then we just attach this little boss later on. Um, so that's, that's one way that we could do this. The other way um, that we could orient this part is if instead of the build plate um, you know, being here, um, we could also look at it in terms of the build plate 
uh, if this was just a top view instead. Um, and this might be a good way to go about it. Um, one of the things to keep in mind is that you know our strength within this plane here is going to be much stronger now. Uh, let me bring back my orange color. Um, See, so yeah, our strength within this plane here. Oh, that's the wrong color. Um, there we go. Strength within this plane here is going to be much, much stronger um, if we orient it like this, where it's laying down on the xy plane. Um, one of the things to keep in mind, though, is that this hexagonal recess, uh, because it is actually going to be a recess, we're going to have a through hole for the bolt and then something to capture the nut in there. Um, this is now going to be unsupported if it's from the bottom. Um, if this is oriented on the top, it might not be too bad. Um, this boss over here, we're building this way now with our layer, so there's going to need to be some support material there. Um, since this isn't going to be extending out too bad, that might be a good compromise to take as well. Um, and I mean, we also have a couple of other alternative options that we'll end up using uh, significantly more support as well. Um, you know, we can flip this. There's there's six main orientations. You know, we could have our build plate be here and start building this way. But um, you know, those are the two main ways that I'd say we can orient this. We can either do X Y plane with this tiny little bit overhanging, um, or we can have um, this be our build plate um, and either split that off as a second part or we can eat, integrate it and just try to rely on support. And in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to split that bottom part off. I'm going to design this whole entire bit as one piece. Um, I think I lost audio. That was on me. <laughs> um, testing, testing, one, two. I remember that these uh, these headphones were giving me issues um, in the past. I have to like play some music in the background. One second. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna like really quietly play some classical music or something. Yeah, these headphones need to have some kind of sound going through them just so that they don't die out. Um, all right, so we covered, so like I said, we covered in-plane, out-of-plane out of strength, covered overhangs and bridges. Um, we can split parts into multiple parts. We don't have to keep everything as one. Um, and we can, uh, we can also, one of the things about rapid prototyping is we can make multiple different prototypes and then find out what's going on. We don't have to, 
kind of design the part right the first time. So don't be, don't feel too pressured to design everything perfectly first time around, feel free to experiment. All right, jumping in. Let's start off with a sketch. Um, going to make our sketch on the front plane here, because again, we're making, um, one thing that I'm going to do is I'm gonna keep in mind where my top plane is. So in this case, top plane's right there. I'm going to use that later to trim my part into two uh, separate parts, so the upper half and that little lower boss sticking out of the bottom. Um, so that's one thing I'm going to do. Uh, I'm going to start, this part's gonna be symmetrical, so I'm just gonna design one half of the part first. I'm gonna lay out the overall shape. Um, actually, I'm going to go up a bit first, then go to about there, and then make my center line. This I'm gonna, this is what I'm gonna use to mirror the part over later. Um, somewhere over here, I'm gonna have a bolt hole that's gonna come through. And then my nut's gonna be oriented right here. Um, and this, the size of this nut is gonna be one of the main uh, driving factors in terms of the overall dimensions. Um, so I'm going to you know, kind of, this is, this is the main thing that we're trying to fixture. So I'm going to uh, draw it out here. Um, I'm going to select this whole chain, set it all as construction geometry, just to make sure, um, you know, in this initial boss that I'm going to be, you know, I'm making the initial body. I don't really want, I don't really care about, uh, this geometry It's going to be added in later, but I need to find out how big it is. So if I remember right, this is where we can use the power of Google. Um, these nut size tables will tell you everything you need to know. So we have a, uh, we're using again a half inch bolt, um, it's three quarter inches across the flats. Um, so we're gonna dimension from flat to flat, it's three quarters of an inch. And SolidWorks adapts that to 19.05 for us. Um, and that is the exact size of that nut. So one thing to keep in mind is that as we print things, the plastic doesn't necessarily give us the exact right dimension. And some of this actually comes down to the slicer and the way that uh, the slicer works. There's all, some of it also comes down to, um, you know, the, the uh, shoot, hold on, the way that meshes are generated. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit later. But one thing to keep in mind is that it's a good idea to, if you have parts that are fitting together, it's a good idea to design little test fixtures where you can print one piece, print another piece, or maybe just print a piece um, at a bunch of different sizes. So like this hexagonal hole printed at 19, 19.1, 19.2, 19.3, so on and so forth, and figure out roughly how much expansion or contraction my part needs to have to account for a good fit. Some of this is also, you know, GD&T stuff to where we're designing parts to fit together. They're, you know, if you have them be exactly the same dimension, um, you know, it's going to be a pretty tight fit to, to assemble those parts together. So one thing we're going to do is instead of 19.05 millimeters, we're going to make this hole a little bit bigger. We're going to make it 19.4 roughly. That'll make putting the nut in there easier. And um, if there's not going to be, at this scale at least, there's not going to be too much, uh, too much risk of the nut free spinning um, and kind of coming loose in there. So there's our main design feature. The next thing to kind of think about um, is, you know, starting to think about designing around physical plastic being laid down. So uh, again, kind of going back to thinking about what really is 3D printing or you know, laying down little beads of plastic in a particular pattern. And each of those beads has a specific width. Um, and this is the line width setting in Cura. There's a couple of other um, settings and other slicers, but basically it's how wide each line of plastic is going down. And generally this is a, either a little bit smaller than your nozzle width, or if you tune your slicer, you can set it up to be exactly your nozzle width. So 0.4 millimeters is the general um, dimension for that. So in our case, what we want is we want the minimum distance between the flat of this hex uh, or this point right here and this outer shape to be a multiple of, all, of our nozzle width if it's relatively small. So if we're just printing um, walls, so just the outer edges, you know, if it's gonna be about five or so layers thick this way, and we're, we're looking down onto the part. Um, or actually, wait, hold on, we're designing the part 
going upwards right now anyways, but in that case, um, we're looking at this distance. Sorry, I was kind of thinking ahead to when we do um, you know, laying stuff down. Um, actually, just really quickly, just to illustrate that, I'm going to pull up a part into Cura just to show you all. Okay, so let's just open up a part that we designed this year for um, for the electronic system. We had a terminal cover, I believe it was that one. Yep. Yeah. Or actually, not that one. It is the. Mm -hmm. Add here the terminal cover, not termination cap. There we go. So we'll rotate this so it sits down flat on the build plate. Uh, yep, good enough settings. Slice this and look at the preview so we can see the individual layers. Try and zoom in here. So you can see these red and, and the green wall uh, or lines, those are our walls that we're printing. Um, and we want this minimal dimension here to be a multiple of the nozzle. And also theoretically these walls or this area here should also be a multiple. You can see that because it isn't, the printer has to put these very, very tiny bits of plastic in there to fill in this gap. I think so 0.4 times six, 2.4. This is probably like 2.5 millimeters wide. Um, if it was 2.4, these yellow lines wouldn't exist. Your print would come out a lot cleaner, be more uniform. You won't have as many issues with kind of tuning in your printer for those really, really tiny extrusions. Um, same thing here. You can see how if this uh, this minimum dimension between that whole edge and the outer edge would mean that these tiny little extrusions don't need to happen. You can just have these big, wide 0.4 millimeter lines going down. Um, and again, this is kind of nitpicking, but it's something to keep in mind. Again, we're designing physical plastic parts that are going to physically lay down these layers of and, and lines of plastic. So if we can optimize our design for that, it means our prints will come out cleaner, more geometrically accurate, um, and they'll also take less time. You know, the printer doesn't have to go through and do those lines if we just shrink this by 0.1 millimeters, which is you know, outside of the realm of human perception effectively um, and functionally would probably not make too much of a difference. Um, so keeping that in mind, let's go back here. So there's a couple of dimensions we want to keep in mind. One of them, you know, let's go ahead and design for both cases in the same go. So we'll design for uh, this dimension here. Um, and I'm going to use my shift key to dimension to that. Right clicking will lock the dimension so I can drag this dimension out of the way. Um, little trick there. So again, I want to design this to be a multiple of my nozzle width. So let's do two. Two millimeters is usually a good start. Um, so yeah, it tells me from here to there, it'll be two millimeters. So if, if I print this, you know, looking down onto the part, there's going to be five uh, layer widths going down that way. And already looking at this, this looks kind of, um, you know, kind of undersized, kind of skimpy. So Maybe I'll up this to 3.2 millimeters instead. Looks a little bit beefier. And the other thing I can do, and just for reference, is to give myself a little construction circle here and make that half an inch. So that's going to be roughly the size of my hole there. So overall, that gives me a good amount of plastic. And then I can look at, you know, since we're printing this vertically, you can make that dimension because this dimension is driving it right now. This tells me, all right, well, 4.7 millimeters, that's pretty thick. Um, also, at that point, you know, we're probably dealing with infill. Let me jump back to Cura. Um, you know, in this case, we have three wall thicknesses. So let's see, if I drop this down to, I'm just going to drop this down to one just to further illustrate my point. So we're only going to have one wall going down. 
And so whatever the thickness of this wall, again, it's going to be multiples of your nozzle width. Um, you know, whatever that thickness is, it'll be there. The rest of it will be hollow with a mix of infill pattern in there. So in this case, the dimension of this wall can really be anything. And once we exceed twice the wall thickness, so once we're past, this should be 1.2. Kira has a weird rounding error um, for this wall thickness for some reason. Um, but yeah, so 1.2 millimeters. So each of those walls is going to be 1.2 or 1.3 millimeters. Once the thickness of the, the width of the feature exceeds 2.5 millimeters, which is double that, we don't really have to worry about that nozzle width issue anymore. It's mostly for thinner features. Um, so we're at 4.7. There's going to be infill in between these parts, so not a big deal. We can uh, we can have this dimension be the one driving it. Cool. Now I have to space this out away from the uh, the base. So we're going to see roughly how far up we want to put that. And I'm going to say, actually, instead of doing that, I'm going to figure out how much plastic I want to put between this and that. Cool. So we're looking at 2.6 millimeters right now. Looks pretty good. I'll probably go up to 2.8. And again, that's kind of going back to that nozzle width. You know, I'll have three lines, 1.2 millimeters, 1.2 coming from the other side. It gives me 2.4. Now I have 0.4 millimeters in between where it might add some infill, or I can up my wall thickness so I can have four wall lines um, gives me 1.6 on each side, so that would actually give me 3.2. So we'll do that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is if I'm designing this to be printed vertically, so starting with the bottom, going up this way, having this be a multiple of my layer width or uh, layer height means that this point, you know, the next layer is going to start over here and start building up to this line. Uh, same thing for a feature like this. You know, if my layer line or my layer height is um, 0.2 millimeters, for example. I'm building this in a, in a draft quality print, um, and I make this 2.5. This geometry is going to end up either 2.4 or 2.6 millimeters, uh, depending on how your slicer rounds. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, if I'm designing parts, again, for physical plastic that's being laid down, you want any kind of vertical dimension um, for a flat surface like this. Um, or a perpendicular surface to be a multiple of your layer height. So in this case, we need a little bit more meat because uh, that's where the bolts are actually going to be mounting up to you. So four millimeters seems like a good one. And that works for 0.2 millimeter layer heights as well as 0.1. Um, so that'll work out well. Um, one of the other things I need to do is make this vertical. OK. Ah, that's why. Okay, coincident. There we go. So we've uh, we've defined most of our sketch. The only thing we need to do is figure out the overall width of this. Um, and for this, I'm going to figure out how much space I really need to leave here for uh, my bolt to go through. Uh, so going back to Google, I'm going to look for metric button head uh, dimensions. So ISO 7380 can look that up. It's going to tell us a bunch of different things about our bolts that we're going to be using. In this case, we're concerned about the diameter of the head, because um, that's what we're going to be using again to fasten the stuff to the uh, to the 4040 extrusion. Um, I know in advance that we're going to be using an M5, because that's the size of T-nut that we have. You could also go for bigger ones, all the way up to M8. We'll work with 4040 extrusion. Um, M5 tends to be what we have on hand, and that has worked out so far. So we're going to continue to use M5 and our head diameter as specified with min and max values. So in this case, 9.5 um, is roughly what we want to leave um, for the head there. So we're going to go with 9.5 millimeters, and that's going to be the distance that we have to leave for a head. We're also going to want to leave some space. I'm going to add a fillet here. Um, to kind of help with reduce, reducing stress concentrations right in that corner. I can find it. There it goes. It's a 10 millimeter fillet. Probably only want like a four millimeter. Cool. So we're going to make this about 10 millimeters. Just give us enough space to work with. 
Um, and now what I can do, I can select the chain, I can select my center line, go right to my mirror tool, and because it because I defined a center line for it already, it'll just mirror everything else over. Really quick, uh, really neat trick for um, for power using SolidWorks. So now we have our overall shape. Looks pretty weird, but this is this is kind of a rough shape that we're going to go with. And the other thing before I forget that we also need to do is we need to look at where we're going to put our um, Um, we're going to need to look at that little boss that we were talking about before. Mm, so in this case, I have a construction line going to my midpoint of that. Um, if we look at our 4040 extrusion profile, um, this one doesn't really tell us too much about what we need to know. Interesting. There we go. That's the one we need. So the thickness of the uh, these little sections here, so where we're actually going to be putting our boss down into is about 4.32 millimeters. Um, so if we actually make it exactly 4.32, then when the nut clamps down, it's only going to be clamping down on our plastic. Um, so we want to leave a bit of a gap there so that you can actually clamp the plastic uh, or our, our printed part to the extrusion, and the nut will clamp to the back of uh, to the back side of this little extrusion finger here. So, you know, plastic part goes up top, nut clamps in from the back. Little gap allows us to tension that down um, and really cinch it down really tightly. So, we'll make sure that this part here. Um, in practice, I found this to be good at about 2.5 ish millimeters since we're working with and trying to design for 0.2 millimeter layer heights because those are universal, we're gonna do 2.4. And then one of the other things we're gonna do is since the bolt hole is gonna be about there, we're just gonna make this the width of the main face just to give a little bit of space for the nut on the backside if we're using a hammerhead nut or something like that. Um, no, I need collinear. There we go. So now we have, again, this is construction geometry, so we're not gonna be using this in this feature. Um, but we can come back to it later and pull from it in a follow-up uh, sketch. Cool. So again, we've designed our main profile. We are going to go ahead and extrude it out. Um, select the sketch that we want to extrude. One of the good things that I like to do is I like to keep uh, a lot of stuff oriented around my midplane, especially if this is uh, if this is a part that's going to be mostly symmetric. Um, keeping a plane in the middle means that you, if you want to design something in the middle of your part, means that you don't have to go back in later and uh, redefine that plane. Uh, so that's good practice. Uh, the next thing we're going to do is we're also going to make this um, just a little bit shorter than the width of the extrusion. Um, and so we're looking at something that looks about like that. And the reason I'm making this a little bit shorter, so if we go back to this extrusion here, we have this fillet that comes down here. So making it the full width, so all the way out to 40 millimeters, doesn't really help us out too much. Um, it's, you know, we're really just concerned about this flat section. So if we can narrow this part down a little bit, um, it would kind of help out, not by much, but just a little bit in terms of saving material. And actually, if we wanted to be extra diligent, we could look up, you know, here we go. Found spec radius for that is about you know 4.5, so really we could go down to about 31 or 32 millimeters wide overall. Um, so let's do that. 32 millimeters. There's our overall base. Cool. So that's kind of our overall shape that we're going for. Next thing to do. So remember, I laid out pretty much everything in this sketch. So one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to show the sketch. I'm also going to rename it to overall layout. Um, and that's just good practice because I'll want to go back and find this sketch later. So just having it named something different will help stand out, especially in larger projects. Um, so next step, front plane, make another sketch. Going to take all of those, I'm going to convert them. One of the things that I want to point out 
is that when we convert construction entities from previous sketches, they come in as model geometry. So again, another good benefit of setting up a lot of stuff in one main sketch, even if it's all construction geometry, it's really easy to bring it into another sketch later on. And then you know all we got to do now is just close this bit off and we're set. So now we can make our little boss that goes in the middle. And in this case, and we can go back to uh, yeah, to this one here. So I have an 8.2 millimeter wide gap there where, uh, where this part's going to sit into. Um, and, and we're trying to design for a little bit of tolerance in there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to extrude this again. So extruded boss. Um, another neat tip is you can access all of your different direction settings through here. So click mid plane. And I'm going to type in, uh, let's see, 8.2. We're going to subtract. Uh, we're just going to go right to eight, I think. Um, that should give us a really nice snug fit. Um, and then just making sure, yep, it did merge to the main body. So now we have that little thing that's going to be sticking in, um, sticking into the extrusion. Cool. So that's our overall shape. Next thing to do is to add a recess for this hex nut that we're going to be putting in here. So I'm going to show that sketch one more time. Make a sketch on this face. I'm pick all the parts that I want to transfer over. Convert. Exit back out. That's all I had to do. Again, laid everything out first. Made sure everything was dimensioned to itself. All I have to do now is just cut this out. And going back to my bolt size, we can look at the hex uh, head size. Uh, we're going to be using a nylock nut for this uh, to keep everything sturdy. It's going to be 1130 seconds. So let's just type that in 1130 seconds. Inches. So that gives us about 8.73125. And that's not a nice round number. Um, so we're going to round that up to nine millimeters. Um, that way our nut will sit in just a little bit more. Um, yeah, be perfect. Cool. So there we go. We have our uh, our hex nut cut out defined. Um, now, one thing we could do is we could take this half inch circle that we defined earlier. Um, really, I was just putting that in there for visualization, just to kind of see roughly how big you know how big the hole is, where it's going to end up. Um, you know, from this top side here, um, you know, that's where that hole is going to be coming out. That's going to be on the bottom. Um, you know, yeah, I could, uh, I could just convert that and cut all the way through. But one of my favorite tools in SolidWorks is the Hole Wizard. Um, I know it's a little bit controversial, um, but one of the things I can do, Hole Wizard, I'm going to punch in ANSI inch. I'm going to go to a screw clearance. I'm going to pick a half inch uh, screw. And then one of the nice things is that it gives you three different options for how tight you want this fit to be. Um, for 3D printed parts, generally I go with either a normal or a loose fit. Um, loose fit if I'm just like kind of bolting a couple things together. Normal if I you know, kind of want it to be a little bit of a tight fit. Um, and then we can kind of see show custom sizing. A normal would give me a 0.5312 inch diameter. A loose one would give me a pint. 0.5469, nice. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll do a normal fit for this. Um, we're not really going to bother too much with any of these other. Actually, one of the things I will do. I'm going to do a countersink on both sides, um, and I wish this would give it to me in millimeters. Um, so let's bring up the calculator really quickly. Mm -hmm. Uh, 0.5312 times 25.4, looking about 13 and a half millimeters. So I'm going to make it, you know, make this countersink be 14 millimeters and far side countersink of 14 millimeters as well. So what this does, so let me, lets me go through here, pick where I want my center point of my hole to be. You can see it's going to give me a hole. It's going to give me some countersinks on both sides. So it's going to help me uh, get that bolt in there properly. Um, and actually, maybe I can make these a little bit bigger, maybe 14.5 on both sides. Cool. 
Sketch is open, self intersecting or intersects Y. Oh, inches. I need millimeters. That would do. Cool. So that kind of gives you a really quick hold that's all controlled here. So if I want to change my bolt size later on, I can just hop in here. If I want to make this, uh, you know, change the countersink or anything like that, everything about this bolt clearance is all controlled within one feature. And you can actually see that that feature creates the sketches um, for the revolved cut for you. Um, so you can actually, if you wanted to be extra, you can go through and change. Now this one's your positioning. This is your whole profile. You can go through and edit those independently if you want. Um, but it's really nice to have it all be within one feature. Um, keeps your feature tree really nicely. It also stands out. It says, hey, here's a half inch clearance hole. So edit that up if you need to. All right. So the last thing we need to do um, is add in our holes that we're going to use to fixture to the 4040 aluminum extrusion. In this case, we don't really need that sketch anymore. We know that it's going to be on the mid plane. So again, hole wizard. In this case, we're going to be using a uh, ANSI metric screw clearance, M5. Also normal fit, it's gonna go through all. Um, I'm gonna look at my custom sizing. It's gonna give me a 5.5 millimeter hole. So in this case, I'm gonna get a 5.8 millimeter countersink on the near side. So that's where the bolt actually goes through. Just helps me locate it um, and get it in. 5.7, we don't need too much on there. So on the sketch here, um, yeah, kind of a little bit more in depth about the whole wizard feature. You can see right now, if you look up in my feature tree, I'm selecting the point tool. So one thing I can do is I can, you know, this just gives me a sketch. I can do whatever I want with a sketch. I can give myself a center line here. I can make this the midpoint at the origin. And then I can dimension how far apart I want to space these from something like this fillet here. So in this case, probably want to space it again. Our uh, our diameter of our head, if I remember right, for an M5, it's about 9.5. So we'll actually do 9.5 divided by two is 4.75. Maybe we'll do 4.8. Cool. So now we have a spot where we can go back into our point tool, click, click. That places down both of our holes that we need to have go through here. All right. And we got our hole going all the way through. Just remember, did I actually put, not do near side countersink, 5.7. So again, whole wizard's really nice because I can, if I forgot to add in a countersink or something like that, I can just add it in through that feature. It makes it really handy. Um, and then you also don't have to remember the specific callouts for, all right, well, I need close fit for half inch bolt. What's that dimension again? Go, go look it up. It's all, it's all built into here. Um, it's really nice. So here we go. We've got our main body designed. The last thing we need to do is add in one of those bubble levels. Um, that's going to happen on this top face. I'm going to draw in just a random circle and I'm going to pull my calipers out of my bag and measure this bubble level that I have. So this is reading out at 9.9 .9 millimeters. Um, so again, kind of based on the fit that I have experimentally determined for my specific printer, I'm going to measure, um, or I'm going to dimension this out to around 10.2 millimeters. So that's about 0.3 millimeters oversized. And we can kind of see one of the issues here with the current design. Doesn't give us enough space to put that bubble level in. So there's a couple things we can do. Um, we can just go right back into, you know, without fully defining that sketch yet, we're just gonna go back into our overall layout. This is probably something I should have laid out first. But, you know, I had this dimension be the one that's driving all this stuff right now. Um, let's see, how do I actually wanna do this? There's a couple ways I can do this. I can make a little extra boss on one side um, to fit in that bubble level, that might be nice. Um, 
do it on both sides. You can switch and choose which side you wanted to use. Um, let's see, how do I want to do this? Mm -hmm. Could also make this thicker so it can go on the inside of the bolt, but I don't think that's going to be very easily readable. So I think what I'm going to do is instead of driving all of this with that, I'm going to, you know, this dimension that I was just putting in there just to check a few things. Um, actually, how do I want to do that? What if I do? Yeah, that's another thing I can do. So right now that's tangent. I'm going to change this, make this a driving dimension. So this is actually going to be what's setting the overall width. And we'll make this 10 millimeters. All right, what's it breaking? So you're telling me this can't be like 5 millimeters? Nope. Why not? So let me lets me go in but not out. Interesting. Very interesting SolidWorks. Oh yeah, duh, that makes sense. Okay. So instead of doing that, what we need to do is actually delete this geometry. Um don't need SolidWorks help. I just need this. I need a line that looks like that. Pull this whole thing out. Oh boy. Cool. I'm gonna make those two or that coincident to that. I'm gonna make those two tangent without selecting the dimension. And we're gonna kind of roughly change the shape of our um, of our part here. And actually, I only need 10 millimeters between this and my center hole. So let's actually do that. It's 11. Cool. And I want this to be probably about 30 degrees. 30 is a nice round number. Cool. I'm going to mirror these over. Going to make those linear with that. Cool, so now you have a part that looks a little bit different um, or a good bit different. Go back in, edit the sketch. And now we can position this a little bit better. So you can make this be vertical. You can space this out away from the inner edge. And actually for that, I'll use this edge and shift key to get the inside edge of that. So one millimeter should be enough. And then we'll look at doing something right around there. What does that give us? 11.3. Cool. So a little bit of design iteration, and we are all set. Um, I do think that having two of these would be a good idea, um, just so I can fixture a bubble level on either side. Mirror that over, and we're done. Cool. Now, one of the things I can do is I can extrude this out, make a nice cut, and looks like this thing is about six millimeters tall. So that's exactly what I am going to do. I'm gonna make it a cut that is six millimeters deep. And instead of choosing just the contour, choose the sketch itself. Um, six millimeter cut. And we're set. So this is our part. We finished designing it. Uh, probably should have saved earlier on. So let's do um, projects, VMS, 2021, 3D printing, chassis jig. This is going to be, what are we calling this? This is the leveling foot. Cool. So we've designed everything we need to do pretty much. Um, the only other thing, so one of the interesting things, I'm looking at this level, it has a little 
cut out at the bottom of it. So one of the things that I was thinking about is, you know, as I press this thing in um, to that divot, um, it's going to have to compress all the air that's underneath it. And if that air has nowhere to go, it might not be too good. But this thing has a nice little cutout at the bottom, so there will be a little air pocket for that air to sit in. If I really want it to be extra, I could make a little tiny hole that goes all the way through the part um, and, you know, just to vent out that air from in there. But it should be good there. Um, so again, we finished designing our part. If we wanted to, we could do some uh, FEA on this to verify how good it is. Um, but going to just do a couple things here. Just fill it a few parts. Make this thing look a little bit nicer. Actually, let's see. Trying to remember which way did I decide that I was going to make this part? It's going to be sitting down like this, right? Yeah, we're doing that first. So um, just going to make that, fit, you know, fill that out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to make these two separate features. Cool. And maybe these will be a little bit narrow for a radius, maybe five millimeters. All right. So. We've pretty much designed our part. Um, and I'm just going to look over my notes here to make sure I covered everything. So we talked about designing dimensions. You know, when we're actually putting wall thicknesses and stuff like that, we're thinking about the physical printed plastic that's going down. It has a certain finite layer thickness. It also has a finite layer width or line width. Um, you can also can, you know, think about your nozzle size. You don't really want to design parts that are narrower than your nozzle size. Um, the quality of the plastic that comes out of nozzles, um, you know, kind of if you're a 0 .4, 0 0.4 millimeter nozzle and you're trying to make a 0.2 millimeter line, it's not going to look too pretty. So, yeah, we have uh, talked about that, um, talked about holes and how to tolerance them as well. One thing that we didn't do um, in this uh, in this part design specifically is talk about uh, tapping yet. Um, we will come back to that in terms of holes um, once we split this part up into two uh, parts. Um, and we'll also talk about that as well. So cool. Um, made sure that I covered all my bullet points. Um, also, just a heads up, I am watching the chat. If you guys have questions, drop them in whenever. Um, and I'll try to answer them as I go. Um, but yeah, so we've designed our, our base geometry. Part's pretty much set. We've smoothed some nice, put some nice fillets in for Matt. Um, sure, he'll be happy about that. Um, if I wanted to spend some time and really make this part look nice, I could and really, really, really make it pretty. Um, that being said, we're pretty much ready to design. Actually, the only thing I didn't check, let me go back into this sketch here. Let me make a little dimension between these two. So that's 1.13. This is 1.67. So um, this width here that I designed as 1.11.30, you know, that's making this wall thickness right here between those two fillets be narrower than three layer, uh, three walls, but wider than two. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to make that 1.2. I'll make that be my driving dimension for this case. And what that leaves me with here is about 1.6. I can right click to lock that dimension so it doesn't keep changing what it's, you know, how it's dimensioning on you. So 1.61, it's basically 1.6. We're set there as well. Um, and then here we have one, which thinking about it now, again, we're, we're going to be making this part this way. So that's not too big of a deal. Um, but if we decide to turn it this way, that's going to be one millimeter um, instead of something like, uh, I don't know, maybe 1.2. Um, and that ends up making that a little bit smaller. So let's try 1.6. So yeah, now both those are at 1.2. This is at 1.6. You know, kind of fiddle around with things to make sure that they all work. Cool. So print prep. I have this part and you know a lot of people will say cool I got this part let me just save it as an STL toss it on the printer and I'll have a part that works you know just fine right out of the gate 
Um, and that's not necessarily the case. There's a lot of things that we can do to make this part better um, for printing specifically. So we're going to clean up our feature tree a little bit here. Let's make a big folder that says main geometry. Um, and then we're going to start talking about things that we can do to prep this part for printing. So um, remember, we're going to split this part into two um, along that flat, say, flat face. We're going to have this bottom piece be separate. Um, and the top piece stay. So we're going to, you know, we have our top plane here. I designed around that. I can use this to go into my direct editing tab. If you don't have this visible, you can go into tabs and then make sure you turn on all the tabs if you want. Um, but the direct editing tab is one I use a lot. So again, top plane, I'm going to split this body into cut the part and this little scissor icon means that it won't go out and try to save it out as its own file. I'm just splitting this within this part itself and I'm using the top plate, uh, top plane to do that. Cool. And we're done. So I have now individually hide and show each of those bodies. Good practice to rename these as well. Uh, this is the main body. This is our, uh, oh, no, nope, not a feature. Uh, rename. This is our locating block. That's what I'm going to call it. Cool. So we get that in there. Um, and what I'm going to do now, um, again, I'm splitting this up. So we're, we're uh, cool. So let me just look at this again. Dimension. We designed this at 2.4, if I remember right. Yeah, 2.4. So my idea here is to use a metric, but a flat head socket cap screw. And it's you know for for metric, there's two different kinds of flat head screws. And flat by flat head, they mean literally a flat head, so countersunk. Um, there's the normal flat head caps or flat head screw, and then there's a flat head cap screw. Um, and what that means is that it just drives off of an Allen or a Torx. So you want to make sure that you look for the socket cap screw instead of the just normal flat head screw. Um, they do have different dimensions. Little quick tip there. Uh, flat head socket cap screw metric. What are we looking at? So we're looking at head height. That's the main thing we want to be focused on. Um, I bring up a picture there real quick. Where are we at? Cool. So we have our head height, which is H here. Um, so this is, because we have not a lot of material there, we're going to want to use the countersunk area of the screw. Actually, we have a good amount, because in that area, Hold on, my brain's working again. <laughs> um, actually, we don't need to use this. We can just use a button head cap screw because we can go back to MS Paint. Uh, I'm just gonna brush this out real quick. So we have our cross section of our 4040 extrusion. And this part's gonna sit in here, right? Um, Sometimes we'll design this little boss to where the nut, or like this hammer, hammerhead T-nut here, will actually go right up to that, again, with a small little gap. And so that's why we clamp this down um, that way. But actually, now that I think about it, because we're putting our, because um, our nut's over here, and this isn't really interfering with the nut there, um, we can, you know, we pretty much have the entirety of this dimension to work with. Um, so this doesn't really need to be that, you know, specifically 2.4. All that we need to worry about is that that block and the cap screw that we're going to use to attach it to the main body here. Um, that this overall height doesn't exceed um, the overall depth, and that overall depth is this one doesn't show it. Oh, they show me the internal. So about 15. 
25, so like 12.6 or so is what we're looking at um, for that overall depth, which is well within our capabilities. All right. So back things up a little bit here. Let's go back into SolidWorks. One of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to adjust the overall height of this. And that's defined, again, in our overall layout sketch. Edit that and give ourselves a little bit more room to work with here. Real quick, easy dimension change. Everything still updates. This still splits it off into a separate body. Um, and now we can focus on um, fastening these two together. So I think I'm still going to use uh, these flat head screws for the main purpose that this uh, chamfered face helps locate and center this part within a hole. Um, and that's pretty much the main purpose that I'm using these holes for. Um, so I think going back to mm -hmm, going back to this page here, flat head socket cap screw. What are our options? An M3 is that big. If we're looking at a button head, we can go up to an M4. Decisions, decisions. All right, we're going to use socket head, flat head, socket head cap screw. Use M3 flat head, socket head caps. And we're looking at the head diameter here to make sure that it'll actually fit in um, to you know, that slot. And actually have to put this part in. An M4, I would love, love to use an M4 but it's just a little bit too big um, unless we wanted to you know, chuck it up in a drill and, and file that head size down a little bit. Our M3 is probably our best bet. The other option is we could do the her heretical move of using Imperial fasteners. Um, so let's look at countersunk bolt Imperial dimensions. Here we go. So we're looking at number six, and we're looking at D2. That's the D2 max, and because we're looking at an eight millimeter, roughly eight millimeter dimension, we have to make sure that our head size is below 3.1 or 0.315. So that would be a 632. And compared to our numbers, or M3, .26. So yeah, in this case, it does actually make sense for us to use an Imperial fastener for once, um, unless we wanted to source an expensive M3.5 flathead uh, socket head cap screw. So this is what we're going to go with, number 632.307. Uh, the other option, as a last check here, sorry, this isn't really much of like 3D printing. This is more about how to pick the right fasteners, which is also a useful, useful skill. Um, but um, flat head metric screw dimensions. So if we're looking at things that aren't, um, Mm -hmm. oh, that's one of those. Uh, back here, flathead socket. Now I just need flathead. I know you have them with just a Phillips. Mm -hmm. They have flathead, you know, flathead drives, which are gross. Don't use those ever. All right, well, we're just gonna go with 
yeah, like I said, for simplicity's sake, at least for this uh, for this workshop, we're gonna make. Um, I think we'll use three holes here. So again, same thing. We're going to do a hole wizard. Um, countersunk. Uh, ANSI inch. And flathead screw. <laughs> Number six. We can see our sizing here. Yeah, so most of these are 100 degrees. Number six, normal. Um, this looks a little small. So this is only giving us 0.279, so that means that the head will stick out a little bit, which actually isn't too bad. So we'll do that. End condition through all. Um, and the other thing that we want to do is, because now we're working with multiple bodies, is we want to make sure that we select the body that we want to cut the hole into. You know, we don't want this clearance hole to go into that. That's where we're going to put a tapped hole, which is something we'll talk about uh, as soon as I'm done with this. So we're going to click on the face, and stick one in the middle, one on either side, add some construction lines, make both of them equal length. Oh, not fixed. Equal length. And we'll do. Yeah, 11.5 should do just nicely. Cool. So you can see, you know, we cut some holes in this part, not in the part below it. Um, and we have three spots where we can locate um, our holes. Now, now's a good chance to talk about tap holes after I grab some water real quick. So, for tapping holes in plastic, there's a couple of ways you could do it. There's one way where you print a hole that is a specific size or specific diameter um, that you determine by trial and error um, to where you can just start threading your screw in, and because the screw is metal and you're screwing it into plastic, it'll cut its own thread. That's great. You can do that. If it'll, uh, you'll be able to dimension things. Um, You'll just have to, I should say, you'll just have to find what dimension you need um, for each of your different screw sizes. Um, so you have to do a little bit of trial and error. The other option is to just put, you know, using your hole wizard, um, you can make a tapped uh, tapped hole here. And we'll go to ANSI metric. Or actually, I should go to just a normal hole, ANSI metric, tap drills. And then we'll pick the thread size that we want to use. Oh, yeah, we're doing inches. That's right. Uh, tap drills. And we're going for a number 6-32, which is the most common thread. Um, so we're going to do that. Then we're going to, because I have a drill and tap set, so I have the correct drill to match up with the correct tap. Um, strongly recommend you guys get some of those. Um, but yeah, so we're going to make a, six, a hole for a 632 tap uh, based on the tap drill size, and you'll have to drill the hole out a little bit yourself later. The other option, of course, is to go in here and add in you know, plus 0 0.02 or uh, plus 0.2 millimeters. So I can add a little bit of extra in there. But generally, what I like to do for holes is just set them to the default values in Hole Wizard, and then just drill them out by hand later. Drill and tap. Um, you can drill them out just to the tap drill size, and then use the screw to cut the threads yourself. Um, you can use the tap to help it get started. Um, you can do all sorts of different things. But the thing to keep in mind, and the most important thing as we go to slice these later, is you want to make sure that when you're tapping holes that you leave a couple of extra walls there that you can drill out and cut the thread into. So generally speaking, you don't want to be doing parts with only two walls. If you're going to be tapping holes into them, four is a good, uh, you know, a good number for taps. Generally, you can get away with three. Uh, but yeah, three to four walls, at least four tapped holes. And that's again more on the slicing side of things. So we're going to make some holes here. Again, one at the origin. I can hover over the hole I just made. 
And this way, both of these parts, because I designed them you know, again, relative to each other, um, both of those holes are going to be aligned. The other thing I need to do is the end condition. I'm going to make this offset from this, uh, from this surface here. <laughs> yep. Um, yeah, 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 come on. So we're going to make a 10 millimeter deep hole. The offset from... Dang, it doesn't let me do that. Um, in this case, I was hoping it would let me offset from this face here. But what I'm actually going to do, I'm just going to make the blind hole at like five millimeters. We'll just call it that. Um, and I'm going to make sure again that I'm only cutting a hole into that. Um, and one last thing, one thing that I forgot to mention as well, um, is it can be nice to add in a little chamfer there um, where you're uh, or a near side countersink um, is what it calls here. Um, a yeah, little chamfer to help you get your uh, tap drill aligned and also your uh, tap itself aligned to that hole as you start cutting your threads. But, you know, again, I did find a hole, arbitrary dimension. I can go in here, can edit this sketch, and it kind of set things up for me. This is the dimension I want to change. Because again, I want to figure out roughly what size screw I'm going to be using. So M uh, or a number six screw um, generally comes in, you know, three eighths inch, half inch, three quarter inch lengths. So I think I'm going to do three eighths inch. And that's again from this face where I'm actually going to be putting the screw in all the way to the bottom of that hole. Cool. It's being finicky. I gotta call this. Cool. So uh, generally, you'll go in and just you know kind of edit the edit the dimensions. If you have to change your dimensions, it'll give you an error that says, "Hey, you got to rename your dimensions," because that's how you know, this whole feature interacts with those sketches. But now my dimension, my depth dimension is driven off of this face instead of off of the face that I started the hole on. The other option would have been for me to just select this face to start my hole depth on, which probably would have been smarter. Um, and then just made sure to only select that. That kind of makes sense. I'll walk, I'll walk through that real quick just to clarify. Um, what that doesn't let me do though is, is do a near side countersink. But yeah, so we'll do a blind hole depth of uh, three eighths of an inch, um, or I think that'll work. But zero point three seven five inches blind, no near side countersink, um, and we're going to select just that body to cut a hole into, and then yeah, I can start my hole on that plane instead. Cool. Same result. Um, and now if we look at that sketch, 9.53, same exact dimension that I had. Um, so two different ways to achieve the same problem. And one of the other things you'll note is that it gives you a pointed hole there. Um, this can be helpful. Um, you know, kind of it's, it's mimicking a drill actually going in there. Um, but this can also be helpful um, because we are going to be printing this you know, kind of standing up. It makes a nice tapered overhang instead of a flat one at the bottom of the hole. Um, so that's very nice and very helpful. Cool. So now we have our two parts. We have uh, fasteners. We talked about drilling uh, and tapping holes. Um, one of the other things that we could do that I've done in the past is I've made interlocking pins that help further align the two parts together. Um, you know, kind of just making a little pin in between here that goes in um, or surrounding, you know, kind of opening up the the start of this hole and making a little boss that sits in there. Um, I might be able to pull up a an example later on to show you guys. But um, that's another thing that you can think about. If you need two parts to fit together very snugly um, and a couple of fasteners you know, might have too much play, you might think about adding you know, just mating pins 
um, or holes in both parts to put a metal met metal mating pin. Um, that's another option as well. So um, at this point, we pretty much have all the geometry that we need for this specific orientation that we wanted to print this part in. Remember, we're printing um, you know, our top plane is here. That's our build plate. Um, both of these parts are going to be printed uh, going up off the build plate. So this is, we can kind of group this together and do make a folder. It says split into two. Cool. So now we're going to prepare each of these parts for printing with a couple of further modifications. Um, again, kind of thinking about how does the 3D printer actually work? What does it actually do? Um, and how can we make this part easier for us to print out? So um, one of the issues that's fairly common, I'm going to see if I can find a good picture of it. Elephant's foot 3D printing. So this is kind of what we're talking about. Um, generally, as you're laying down your first couple of layers, the flow rate is greatly increased on your first few layers, uh, first two, one or two layers. Um, and this is to promote good bed adhesion. You really want to have tons of material flowing so you fill in the little tiny cracks within your build plate that help the print just stick to it really, really well and grip. Um, you can kind of see here, it'll kind of bow out. Um, so one thing that's, uh, one thing that you can do uh, to, to kind of pre-process your model for 3D printing, if you don't want to go in and remove those elephant's feet yourself, um, is you go in and you add a chamfer. I'll do a chamfer that's twice, uh, generally twice the size of whatever layer height you're using. Um, so for, again, in this case, we're designing for 0.2 millimeter layer heights. So we're going to just click on this whole entire face and chamfer that at 0.4 millimeters. Uh, so you'll see that gives nice little uh, 45 degree slope that comes out on all of these edges. And that works out very nicely. So that way, as we print this part, that extra flow rate, it'll basically square this part off almost perfectly. This is also something you can tune in for your own printer. You can mess around with different uh, chamfer settings for each uh, each of your layer heights. So, you know, sometimes for a 0.1 millimeter layer height, you might need to do a 0.3 millimeter chamfer instead of a 0.2 that you might have thought initially. Uh, but again, this is just because we're pushing down tons of plastic in the first layer. Some of it ends up spilling over on the edges. Um, and this can help to mitigate some of that um, rather than spending tons of time tuning your printer um, and you know, your slicer settings. Um, so that's, that's really handy here. Um, the other thing that we can do is we can start to think about these round holes um, and starting to mitigate overhangs. So in this case, we can do one of two things. We can either print with supports um, in these holes here um, to make sure that the tops of these come out very nicely or we can actually modify the shape of these holes to uh, to make the, the parts, uh, or to basically get rid of the overhang and to have as little bridging as necess as possible. So um, we're gonna talk, you know, the first one's pretty easy. Now it's a slicer setting, we just adjust our supports, but we're actually going to experiment with um, editing hole perimeters or hole shapes uh, for vertical holes. So what we're gonna do, um, is we're going to, well, let me just start by converting both of these entities. So we actually have sketch geometry to work with. Um, we're going to make something that looks like a little trapezoid, basically. And I'm going to make this part construction geometry and horizontal as well. Um, and make these tangent with my circle. There we go. And now what we have to do, or yeah, I also need to make these two equal to each other. Then I'm gonna make a, um, I guess the, the better way to illustrate this would be to make a vertical line. And this is kind of what your slicer uh, calls, you know, the overhang settings. So from your vertical axis, how much is a part overhanging? Um, and generally, you know, 45 degrees is a good number to basically stay away from. You want things to be less than 45 degrees uh, overhanging. 
sometimes you can push your printers to 50, 55 degrees, maybe 60, um, but generally designed for 45 degrees or so. And then this top little bit here is about how much bridging we want to have. Um, so for, you know, we could theoretically put this up all the way to a complete point if we don't, if we're not comfortable with any bridging at all. Um, but sometimes, you know, a little bit of bridging our printer can handle. So in, in this case, maybe our printer can handle about two millimeters of bridging um, without any significant issues. And we're going to mirror these over. There we go. And now what we can do is we can trim away, um, actually the outside is what we need to trim away. And we can cut up to this surface here. So I'm just gonna double click on the surface that automatically switches my mode to up to surface and picks that face that I'm gonna be cutting to. And I'm just gonna make sure that I only cut this body because I am working with multi-body parts. So that's kind of what we're working with. Um, we have, you know, we still have right around, I'd say 75% or 80% of the original hole left to locate our uh, little leveling knob uh, or leveling bit. The other thing that I've seen done, I don't tend to do this very often. I actually pretty much never use this because um, I tend to design my parts so that, you know, in this case, they would print this way if I really was concerned about fit up in that hole. Um, uh, the other thing I've seen done in these situations um, is also, I guess I shouldn't have deleted that so soon, just control Z instead to get back into the sketch. Cool. And then I'm going to undo those trims. The other thing that I've seen some people do is adding kind of a rectangle at the bottom here. Um, let me just make this coincident there. make those two tangent. Cool. So what I can do, I'm just gonna leave those trim bits as construction geometry. Um, essentially what we're doing here is we're making it so that um, as we start to lay down these layers, the bottom of this hole doesn't get muddied up um, or get caught up within a layer change. Um, and again, it kind of just cuts out a little bit more of this and then makes it stair step up, um, just cleans up this very bottom hole mating surface. So I've seen this done. I'm not saying that you need to do this, but it is out there. Um, if you're, you know, if you find yourself in a case where you really have to design holes that are um, kind of along the Z axis um, and you don't want to do too much cleanup or anything like that, or the fitment of that hole is very, very important this can be something that you can do to help clean up that hole. And then same thing. You can use this extrude cut to that. Uh, regions, that's what I did wrong. The entirety of that sketch maybe. Oh, I think it's because I forgot to trim stuff off. Just make sure, oh. Sketch. Yeah, I didn't trim this bit here. I'm bad. Just make sure that I got both of these here, yep. There we go. So this is pretty much whole cleanup. For this middle one, I'm actually going to go ahead and use uh, supports in this hole. Um, and then I'm just gonna clean this out with a half inch drill bit, because that's what I'm putting in there. I'm putting in a half inch bolt. Uh, if that surface comes out a little rough, don't really particularly care. And then on this side, you know, I have 60 degree overhangs with this. Um, and in my case, my printer can handle that. Um, if your printer can't handle 60 degree overhangs, no big deal. Um, you might just want to add in some support there. Um, but at this point, we've made, you know, we've prepped our main body for printing. You know, it's got chamfer on the bottom. 
Um, it's got these holes fixed up. Let's do the other body real quick. There we go. So in this case, we have two different ways you can print this. Um, and in, you know, technically, this is the top orientation, or this is the top face right now. I'm going to actually make that my bottom face when I go to print. Same thing, I'm going to chamfer this, 0.4 millimeters. Cool. And in that case, that's really all I need to do. It's a pretty simple part here. I'm just going to, you know, this is going to be my bottom face. It's going to go down onto the part. Countersunk holes are going to end up at the top. And that's really it. So this is all my print prep. Just three little simple steps to get this thing print prep ready to go. Cool. So I can reshow my main body. Um, and just as a quick tip, I'm using tab to hide bodies and shift tab to uh, show them again. Um, quick little SolidWorks tip that's very, very nice. Um, yeah, now we're pretty much ready to export, which is the main thing um, that we need to do. And since we have two parts here, one of the things that I do is, you know, you can, you can go in here and you can save all the individual bodies into their own parts. Um, I like keeping everything in one part. Um, you know, basically, if I click on solid bodies and I hit save bodies, this is going to make two different parts. And I'm going to you know, pick names for them. Um, and they're going to be SolidWorks parts. Um, so I can't save directly to STL as individual bodies. What I can do, though, is I can delete or keep bodies. And usually, I'll set it to keep. I'm just going to say, cool, I just want to export that one right now. Click off of it. Control Shift S. Um, in my case, I actually went in and added that keyboard shortcut in. I'll show you guys how to do that here in a second. Um, or actually, let me do that real quick. Because that's that's one of the keyboard shortcuts that I'm really surprised isn't a default keyboard shortcut in SolidWorks. Um, so keyboard, uh, the system options here, there should be, um, um, I think um, yeah, it should be just in system options. Or no, it's in customize. So I just right click anywhere on the feature tree or on the on the buttons there. Hit customize. This lets me customize my toolbars. So as you guys saw, I've been using my uh, my shortcut toolbar there a lot and I've customized it pretty thoroughly. You can drag and drop stuff onto it. Keyboard. Then we go to File, Save As, Control, Shift, S. Job's done. Like, just add that in. It'll save you tons of time going into your file manager. Anyways, Control, Shift, S, saving out the main body. Um, one thing I like to do um, is, uh, is make folders for all my parts as well. Let's do like an STLs folder. But in this case, um, I'm just going to save it here. Leveling foot, um, main body. It's going to take a minute. And you can see that mesh is pretty dense. Um, this is not what you're going to get with your default settings. Um, so um, one thing, you know, before I actually do save this out, let's go ahead and look at some of our mesh settings. So again, if I go to STL, leveling foot, main body, look at my options. So I'm exporting as different mesh formats here, and I can just adjust all sorts of different formats, you know, export-wise here. STL, we're going to be outputting at its binary STL. My units, you will always want to make sure you set your units right. Most 3D printing softwares will default to a millimeter standard unit. Um, so sometimes this might be set to centimeters by default, or you might have it set to inches. Millimeters is where it's at. Then you have a couple of different options. By default, I'm pretty sure it's set to coarse. Um, so you can kind of see this preview here of something that is supposed to be pretty circular. Um, and you can see that it starts to break it up. It picks, you know, in this case, what, 10 points along that circle, draws lines in between. So if this is a hole, like something that you're trying to put a pin into, uh, you can see how that hexagon now, or this, this decagon, uh, is kind of cutting down the size of that hole. And if this is a clearance hole in the middle here, you know, or if this is the outer face, it's actually going to end up a little bit smaller, and you're going to start to see flats in your print. 
can also go to fine. Um, same thing, starts to round out a little more, but I like to go custom and crank my angle deviation pretty high, around three degrees or so. Um, then also your deviation here, this is the amount of deviation you have from a surface. Um, usually I go about 0.05 or so is the deviation that I allow, uh, deviation tolerance. Um, it'll show my info before I save it as well. Um, and then um, there's also an option here to save all components of an assembly in a single file. Um, in this case, we're working at a multi-body part level. This is a feature request that I've already asked SolidWorks for to be able to save individual parts as individual files or individual bodies as individual files. Um, but yeah, this is the, these are the settings that you wanna change. You wanna make sure you get your angle deviate or your deviation down reasonably so, um, and then your angle tolerance if you want really nice smooth curved features, which I tend to do a lot of, I end up going with a three degree angle tolerance. Um, if you're making a lot of like squared off brackets, um, a 10 degree angle tolerance or a five degree angle tolerance might be just fine, but we'll do that. We'll hit save as STL, give me my mesh preview again, and you can see that that face over there is getting broken up into a ton of different triangles. Same thing in here, all these things are getting broken up into tons and tons of tiny little faces. Um, makes your files bigger, but part quality improves pretty drastically. So go ahead and save that out. And now I'm going to go back into this feature, I'm going to click that to deselect it, click the bottom one, right click to confirm, same thing. Control Shift S, STL, leveling foot, locating block. And there we go. This one's gonna be a lot smaller of a file. Still gonna take a bit to break it up into different meshes. Um, but you can see that big face over there, it's big and flat, it's rectangle, it's made up of two triangles. That's all that needs to happen on that face. Um, but it's all those round features that end up being broken up into tons and tons of tiny little triangles. Cool. So that is, um, that's that pretty much. Um, there's a couple other little tools that I wanted to point out um, really quickly. So I'm gonna suppress this body or that feature there. Uh, there's another tool that helped out a lot when I was starting off, it's this move face command. If you like get pretty far into design and then you're like, damn it, I don't think I added you know enough, enough space in this feature here. Um, you know, I, I think I just dimensioned it to the exact flats and I didn't leave an extra, you know, 0.2 millimeters or whatever. Check this dimension. Yeah, you know, 19.4, that really needs to be 19.6. Uh, move face will let me offset all of these. Oh. Oop, oop. There we go. I'm gonna offset it by 0.1 millimeters and I'm gonna offset it outside. So I'm gonna grow this face by 0.1 millimeters in each direction. Boom, job's done. It's another helpful thing for print prep again. So if I'm preparing this part for printing, move faces out and you know, especially if I get something from somebody else um, and they didn't go through all the steps, you know, without going too deep into their feature tree, especially if it's messy and full of undefined sketches. Um, you know, I'm probably just gonna go in and add some uh, some move face commands to move those faces out and make sure that things will fit together just right. Um, so that's a really good tool to keep in mind, specifically again, for print preparation. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, that's pretty much it in terms of the designing for the 3D printing part. Um, all we have to do now is you know, drop this into our slicer. So let's open up Cura again. Um, going to go back to my prepare tab, clear my build plate, and open up both of those parts that we just designed. Uh, 3D printing, chassis jig. Uh, we're going to click on both of those. Um, another thing that I'll point out is that uh, SolidWorks is a Y up um modeler so the y axis is what's pointing up in 3d printers the z axis is generally what's pointing up so there's you can change this within solidworks um in your view orientation um trying to remember 
Um, yeah, right here. You can apply Y up views or you can apply Z up views. Um, cool. So that changes. There you go. So now our Z axis is going that way. Uh, one thing that's you know, once I get around to making uh, templates for the team, I'm probably going to make all the templates by default be Z up, because that tends to be, you know, in uh, in your in uh, the vehicle axis system that the SAE has, you know, X and you know X is longitudinal, Y is lateral, Z is up. Um, so that's important. Um, all of our normal forces are FZ on the tires, all that kind of stuff. The suspension geometry is all in XY, you know, XY as the ground plane and Z as the up axis. Um, 3D printers also do it. I don't know why SolidWorks still keeps Y up, but by default, SolidWorks is Y up. So keep that in mind. That being said, rotating parts in Kira isn't all that hard. Um, so um, going to apply Y up views again. So again, this is this is what SolidWorks defaults to, and that's why all these parts are um, angled on the side. So uh, we're going to rotate these parts; so they sit flat the way they should be. Um, cool. Click, click through. You know, arrange my parts with Control R, and then we can kind of you know, we can go through those settings that we talked about before. If some of your settings aren't visible, you can right-click on the settings icon and check as many of them as you want. You can also go up into here and hit all to show all of the settings, which kind of ends up being a really long list. Um, but the main ones are layer height and we're defining, designing for 0.2. My initial layer height is also 0.2. Um, my line width, and that's kind of the width of the nozzle that it's jetting down, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, force all these to 0.4. Uh, my infill line width, I don't really care the size of it, you know, 0.57, more material goes down in the infill, kind of speeds up the infill process as well. Um, if I'm doing a skirt or a brim line width as well, 0.4 millimeters. And then here you can see the initial layer line width squirts out 100 or 20% more plastic um, on the initial layer, uh, just to make sure that everything sticks really, really nicely to the bed. Um, you can tune this down to like 110 or 105 if you really dial in your bed adhesion, uh, but keeping it at 120 is important. Um, cool. And we have our wall thickness here. Um, remember, we were looking at kind of 1.2 millimeter wall thickness. Um, that's what we want. Um, so three wall lines. Um, actually, since we're making some parts, we'll go ahead and do 1.6. Um, the other option is I can just go directly here and say four. But we designed for 1.6, so we're going to go 1.6. Um, top bottom thickness, this is how many layers are on the top and bottom. We don't really care too much about that. Our infill density, you know, this is going to be a pretty structural part, so I'm going to crank this up to like 40, not 420, 40%. Um, triangles should be fine. Got my print tab, which we don't really care about. Speeds, don't care about those too much right now. Um, and then we got to generate some support. So here's our overhang angle. Anywhere with that amount of overhang will. Uh, We'll have some support added to it. So you know, this whole nut face here is going to have support in it. We'll do 45 degrees or 46. So anything 45 or under will not get support on it. But anything that is more than 46 degrees from the vertical will. Um, and then we have tons of support settings we can play around. The last thing that I also forgot to do is we're printing this in ABS. So I should change that. Um, I'm going to keep all my changes that I made, and the only thing I need to do is update my print temps to 220 um, and 85 on the initial layer. Cool. Build adhesion. Just going to do a skirt. Pretty confident in my bed adhesion solution, and we can slice this out. Cool. So it's going to take five hours, two minutes to print each one of these. If I want to make multiples of them. Three copies, control R to arrange them all on the build plate really nicely. Kira does a pretty good job most of the time with this stuff. Slice it out. Cool. Take a little under a day to print four of these. Um, but yeah, that's the 3D printing portion of it. Um, I guess any questions before we dive into first article inspections? 
That was a good time. Cool. I'm going to take that as no questions. <laughs> um, and we'll jump right into creating first article inspections. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the theory of first article inspections real quick. And to do that, I'm going to pull up this good website here. If you just search FAI template, uh, GUSCAD, I think is how it's pronounced. Um, these guys have a pretty good article on first article inspections. Um, it's not complete. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's not complete. And it's, you know, kind of one of the reasons is this template that's used here and the one that I based our template off, the AS9102B is an SAE template and it costs about 160 bucks to get this supporting documentation for it, which is, you know, that's kind of how the societies operate is they have their standards and to access the standards and to use them, you have to pay them money. That being said, this template is easily available. Um, and the important thing is, is, you know, kind of, it's generally split up into three forms. In our case, it's going to be two, and I'll talk about why in a second. But you have three forms. You have your part number accountability forms, what they call it, uh, product accountability and characteristic accountability. Form one and form three are the two more most important forms for us. Form two doesn't really matter as much for a lot of the stuff that we're doing. So um, part number accountability looks something like this. You have a bunch of stuff about the part number that you're inspecting, um, you know, what revision level it is, you know, your drawing number, as well as the part number, the serial number, the report number that you're attaching to this, the PO number, because usually you send the stuff out to somebody else, your uh, POs, suppliers, all this kind of stuff. Um, and then you have some details here. So you can do a detailed uh, uh, first article inspection or an assembly level one. Um, so detail just means that you're just doing just one part, detailing in on that and doing an inspection on that. Or if you're actually assembling several parts together, um, maybe you have a couple of bolts that you need to include, bolt two parts together and then measure overall dimensions. Assembly FEI is what you check there. Then you also have the option to do a full or a partial. So let's say, you know, this, is, this actually happened pretty recently. David sent me a part. Um, he had me do a first article inspection on it, found some stuff he wanted to change, sends the part back again. Instead of me having to go and measure all of the dimensions that he was already happy with the first time around, you can just do a partial first article inspection um, and then just say, hey, I just want you know to check these five dimensions, the rest of them were fine. So that's partial FEI versus the full FEI. And what you wanna do is if you're doing a partial, you wanna reference the original as well. Um, and so there's fields for that here. And then again, if you're doing an assembly level one, you list out each part, um, that you're using to assemble everything together. If they have uh, FEIs that were done on them as well, like let's say you have a very specific connector that you're sourcing from a manufacturer and you did an inspection on that um, and that needs to made it to this assembly, you can reference the inspection for that connector as well. So if there's some tolerance stack up issue, you know where to look for it. And then of course signatures, because you need to know who, who prepared the FEI, who completed it, um, if it got approved or not and reasons why. So that's all on the first page. This is kind of like a cover sheet. Then your second page, this is the one that's still most confusing to me. And from my understanding, this is like, if you have specific test fixtures or specific procedures that you're doing to you know, kind of more in-depth R&D level stuff uh, for, our, for our purposes, you know, pretty much we're just measuring stuff with calipers and that's really it. Um, you know, if we're adding like sealant or rivets or, you know, other raw materials to this assembly, that's kind of what this is for. But, you know, the, the this subpart list, in my opinion, takes, a, you know, for 99.99% of the stuff that we're doing, the subpart list will take, uh, will account for most of that. Um, in this case, like if we were welding the chassis and we really wanted to specify what weld material we were using for different areas, you know, we do that here. Um, but again, not super important. Form three, this is the big one. Um, this is the one that we're gonna walk through today for our part. Um, and this is the one that I transferred over to our, um, to our FAI template. 
So it's kind of hard to see, so I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Um, basically, this is a landscape. Uh, this is you know the first few pages are portrait mode. This is a landscape mode um, because basically what you have uh, again this is characteristic accountability. So there's characteristics that you're defining, and uh, you have you know this will usually be matched up with or not usually this should be matched up with a ballooned drawing. Each of those balloons is going to have its own number. It's going to tell you where it's at. Um, this designator field, this is like if you have a, you know, a critical or a major, you just like put that in here. Um, but I think that we can do that with an, a requirement field. But the requirement, all right, so you have some stuff, you know, some notes say that, hey, this, you know, this needs to be done after we apply, you know, paint to the chassis. Okay, cool. You know, yes, we're doing this inspection after we applied paint to the chassis. Um, there's dimensions here, um, reference datum locations, uh, flatness, all sorts of stuff that you can do. Um, but for the most part, in our case, it's going to be a lot of dimensioning um, and and all that kind of stuff. We might get to the point where we start measuring flatness or roundness of of things as we go on. But um, you know, kind of th that's what we have here. Um, you're going to be listing out your units of measurement. And that's your characteristics section. You can see up here, characteristics. This is all the stuff that you fill out when you're preparing the first article inspection. And then on the right side here is what you fill out when, you know, what the inspection person actually fills out. So yeah, okay, well, this needs to be five inches plus minus, you know, uh, 10 thou, cool. Five and five thou, cool. That's, uh, that's gonna be good. You know, we'll do some conditional formatting to make this green or something. Um, you know, same thing here. All right, cool. Well, I measured it. It was like this. Um, you know, here they're listing out. All right, well, we did this visually. We did a radius gauge, CMM. Um, this column here, column ten for a qualified tooling. Um, if a specially designed tool is, you know, we use this media of inspection. Um, pretty much, I'll I'll switch to our template here in a second, but the CMM caliper stuff is going to be listed. And you know, basically, how did you get to that value? is something that you want to account for here as well. And of course, at the top, we got all our stuff that references. So if you lose track of a page and don't know what report number it goes to or what part number it's at, it carries over for all of them. Um, and then here's what a balloon drawing looks like. So I have all these different radii here. Um, for example, all these different dimensions that need to be checked. And you, know, you label them 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, so on and so forth. Um, and then those, of course, match up to here. Um, this takes some time in SOLIDWORKS uh, without the SOLIDWORKS inspection, inspection add-in. So that's something that is going to be pretty important for the team to look into for next year, um, is to get uh, the SOLIDWORKS inspection add-in and see if uh, Dassault will sponsor that for the team. Um, that being said, um, this can be done. You just have to go in and manually add notes and type in one, put your balloon there, two, you know, three, four, or five, so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, that's we'll go through that workflow for this part um, after I go over the template here real quick. So let me just go over documents, projects, EMS, uh, FAI template. So this is something I threw together last night. Um, it's not a hundred percent done yet. So if you have any, like somebody just. Uh, Hello. These columns are a little too wide now. Let's make these 0.75. Yeah, there we go. Cool. So this is what we're looking at. Um, we have you know, our part number. So in this case, oh, it wants me to log into PDM. Um, I'm going to do chassis 21 deep design part. This is going to be a uh, jig, uh, jig foot leveling foot for chassis jig revision A. Um, subsystem is chassis. Manufacturer is Victor. Uh, I'll type in my full name, I guess. Manufacturing processes 3D. Uh, FDM uh, report number FAI chassis 
0003, for example. This is a part level. Um, I made it conditional here, so uh, instead of doing detail or assembly, just part or assembly. Makes it a lot simpler for our team. We're pretty much only dealing with parts, um, but if we have an assembly that we want to inspect, you know, it'll tell us to fill out those fields. But since we're just doing a part, not needed for part FEI, skip down to the bottom. Um, it's going to be a full inspection. Uh, this, I forgot to add conditional stuff here. I'm just going to do that as well. Cool. So that way, if I select full, it's NA. If I do partial, it gives me a blank. Cool. Um, now we're going to go down. Actually, I'm going to really quickly, before I forget, I'm going to save as um, FAI, FAI chassis 003. Cool. So I don't have any parts that I need to list out. I'm just going to say that I'm preparing this. Yes. And actually, I gave myself a drop down here. Yes. Name Victor Kozhenov. And today's date is going to be 2021-04-17. And I should change those date formats as well. Make sure that they're standard. Um, maybe I'll just do... Okay, so notes to, notes to improve. Cool. Um, so went ahead and prepared that. Now we're going to go here. See all this stuff carried over from the first page. So set up the template fairly robustly. Um, and now we're at the point where we have to start making a dimension drawing. Um, again, really quickly, added some notes here too. Number should match balloon drawing. Just reference location, location on balloon drawing, the requirement, the unit, and I added plus minus tolerance. So this way um, we can check our result here and I can do a uh, conditional format as well. Um, that'll say, hey, if this, if this is between these two, color green, otherwise it's red. So that'll be really nice. Um, we can um, yeah, pretty easily, you know, if, if this whole column is green, you know our part's good. Um, tool used, um, maybe measurement method. Um, but yeah, tool used is good. And then additional details or comments in here. Hmm. Any questions about the template? Template looks good. Pretty straightforward. Try to keep it simple to kind of what we're going to encounter on the team, but also match the formatting to the industry standard AS9102B um, inspection report. So kind of warms us up to the idea of doing these templates without having to dive in and do like all this, you know, this second form that doesn't particularly make too much sense and you know, go through a bunch of other stuff. Um, so hopefully that makes uh, makes sense to people. Our step now, or what we need to do now, is to make um, dimension drawings for this part here. And what I'm actually going to do is unsuppress this part. Um, and then I'm going to edit feature. I'm going to delete that. I'm going to rename this part here. Um, I keep brain spacing out on the rename. Um, this is uh, lower locating block delete. And then I can also do delete key body. I'm going to delete that one. This is uh, main body delete. Oh, hello. Cool. So now you have two deletes. Um, I can configure both of these features. So this is really neat um, with SolidWorks configurations. Um, basically, what I can do is I can say default, and then I can say uh, locking block, and then I can just say main body, or locating blocks, or rename configuration. So in this case, uh, in our default, we're not going to be deleting anything. In just the locating block, we're going to delete the main body and vice versa for the main body configuration. And hit OK. 
It's going to make a few configurations. So now you can see both of those are suppressed. We can see both of our bodies. But if I go into um, you know, our locating block feature itself, did I get these backwards? I definitely did. So let me configure those features. Yeah, that's right, because we're suppressing the deletion. So we're keeping keeping that body, but we're deleting the main body. Kind of flip, trips me out. Maybe doing a, a keep bodies instead of a delete bodies would be nice, but it's kind of hard to have both of them in there. Anyways, we're gonna hit okay. So now we have our right configure, our, our configurations are correct. Um, so our locating blocks there, our main body on its own is there, and our default. So we're going to make a drawing from this part, or not open drawing, make drawing from part. You just start main drawing template, and I should have the VMS sheet formats in here somewhere. Yep, VMS B landscape millimeters. Cool. And all I really want is an isometric view right now. Cool. So this is going to be in our default configuration. It's going to be up there. I think our sheet scale could probably go down to something like I don't know, three to one. Or no, this is three to one, probably one to one. One to one should be fine. Actual size. One other thing I like to do is I like to make these shaded because we're mostly dealing with PDFs these days. So um, not too big of a deal to make that shaded. And maybe even defining an, a different view to where we can see a little bit more of the body would be nice. Um, actually, let me show you guys how to do that real quick as well. So let's say I wanted to set up a view. Um, I can use my arrow keys to kind of more granularly um, move this part around. So let me go to the front face, rotate it around so I can kind of see, yeah, this is a through hole, and then rotate it down just a smidge. So I can see that there's some kind of base at the bottom. Um, let's see. I rotate it more. No, it doesn't really tell me more. So, yeah. I'm going to define a new view that's right around here. The other thing I can do is, let me just go back to this. I can click on that with my middle mouse button. And now when I, uh, oh, hold on, go back to the front view. I'm just going to click on this edge with my middle mouse button. And now when I rotate, it's going to rotate around that. So I can get a little bit less of that hole in, in my site. And I go there, eh, probably a little too much. So yeah, this is kind of like finicky stuff, but uh, if you're preparing drawings, it tends to be nice to have a really good view. So something like this, cool. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to create new view. This is going to be my drawing corner view. Hit okay. Cool. So now when I go in here, oh, not control, alt tab, control tab, change this to be a drawing corner view. So that kind of shows a little bit better about what my part is like. Um, if I really wanted to, I could do an exploded view too there. I can do a whole bunch of stuff. But um, you know, that helps show a little bit more clearly what my part is actually like. Um, so in this case, now we got to add some drawing views. Do model views, going to do that one. Yep. OK. I'm going to choose my configuration. I'm just going to do my main body. Um, and again, we're going to use, we're going to make sure it's on the sheet scale. So we'll do, let's see, what are we looking at here? This is the, uh, oh no, I don't need that. I need my front view. Yeah, give me that. Cool. So front view, I'm going to add some projected views. My right, yeah, from this one. Right view, and again, back view maybe. Cool. All right, so now I have front, side, and back views. These kind of show me the important bits, um, pretty much what I need to know about this part. There's not too much that I need to, actually I do need to check dimensions on the bottom as well. 
So let's go ahead and do that. Make another projected view at the bottom. Cool. And that should tell me everything that I need to know um, about the main body. So now I just have to add the dimensions that I really care about. Again, we're doing an inspection. So really, I don't want to dimension all the things. Just want to dimension the things that are important to the person who's going to be measuring this part. So go in here. Let's add some smart dimensions. Click between those two. This little toolbar pops up. Let's me just really quickly position my dimension above or below the part. I'm going to go ahead and do above. Uh, I'm going to give this dimension as well. Overall thickness of the part is something that I care about as well. Overall width. Sometimes that doesn't work perfectly. There we go, overall width. And then I also care about this just to make sure that I have enough space for everything else that I'm trying to put in there. And that's pretty much all I really care about from this view. I wanna make sure that my whole clearance is, is right. Um, you know, right there, got 13.9, mill four nine millimeter diameter hole, um, four millimeter thickness. Um, yeah, that's really all that I need to know about this drawing. I don't need to dimension the radius of all these bends and the angles and everything. You know, this really just matters so that I know if I can fit stuff in, um, you know, if I can fit a screw in on this side, that's a quick dimension to check overall width as well. Um, cool, so we have that. Uh, and one thing that I'm gonna point out here is that these uh, these dimensions are a bit too precise. Like if I ask somebody to do three, you know, 34.70, they could kind of get that with a caliper, but based on how hard they're squeezing the part, it might be, you know, might read like 34.717273, you know, or, you know, 34.69, um, you know, anything like that. It, it might vary a little bit. So one thing that I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my options, document properties. Um, also going to change my standard to ANSI real quick. Um, this is going to be the standard for all of the team drawings going forward as the ANSI standard. Then I'm going to go down to my dimensions, set my defaults to just be 0.1 precision. So any dimension that I do, point, you know, I'll only have one decimal place. Um, and that'll kind of tell me how precisely I want to, or I really care about these dimensions. So um, everything will update really quickly. So the reason I chose ANSI is because it makes all the dimensions horizontal. Um, I don't know why ISO really likes tilting heads to uh, to read critical dimensions, but um, everything's horizontal now. It's going to be easier to put balloons on stuff too. Um, yeah, and then everything's down to one millimeter precision now. The next step is going to be to um, Dimension all this, uh, you know, pretty much the rest of the stuff. What do we have here? Um, the other thing I'm thinking about here is that I'm probably going to need to add a section view. I want to be able to quickly dimension the depths of these two features as well as the uh, the hex hole here. So let's add a section view. We're going to add that at about the height of. Let's see. Not at that height. Okay. I'm going to use my control key to break the alignment of that section view. And there we go. Now I have a section AA view. This way I can dimension that depth really easily. Cool. And I can also dimension this depth pretty easily. If I really wanted to, I could also move this dimension over here. Might give me a little bit more space for. Um, oh yeah, never mind. Um, I forgot that section was a little bit lower down. If that was aligned with the center line of that, that would work. But let's go ahead and add that dimension back in. Cool. Um, so now I have, you know, the only dimension I need here. It's my overall width. I want to make sure that that's the right width. Um, on the back side, only thing I care about is this. It's my radius. Um, 
want to make sure that that fits. Um, all right. What else do we have? What else do I need a dimension? I guess it would be nice to dimension this area here. Make sure that that's still the right height above it. Although in this case, actually, it doesn't really matter how tall that is. Um, again, we just need plastic to be around it. Just needs to sit there. Um, that's really all that matters. Just needs to exist. Um, oh, that's the other nice thing is it would be nice to specify a parallel. Um, I wonder. Tabs, annotation, geometric tolerance, symbol, parallel, um, shoot, I don't really know. And I'm going to make, where can I put that? I don't know how to do GDNT. I wish they taught me. Um, but anywho, um, it would be nice to specify also a requirement to say, hey, these two need to be parallel, and then uh, also that this face needs to be perpendicular. Um, actually, easy way to spec perpendicular. Here we go. Um, and and all the other thing to keep in mind, as you start making these dimensions, you want to make sure that these are dimensions that uh, people can actually measure. So this 90 degree measurement right here, yeah, I can get you know I can get an angle finder on that. But if I wanted to try and do something like in really deep inside the, uh, um, you know, like trying to measure the 90 degree between this top face and this flat face here. Probably wouldn't be too easy. Um, I'm going to move this dimension over to the side here instead. Leave some space for that. Last thing I need to do, um, and this height isn't really specific. Pretty much got everything that we need to exist here. And on second thought, don't really care to inspect either of these. I'm just going to try to cut down on time. Yep. So now only thing we need to do is spec out these hole positions here. So I'm going to dimension the distance between those two holes. I want to make sure that it's 11.5. Same thing here. 11.5. Um, do that. Other thing I'll point out, I've been using this feature a lot recently. So if you noticed, as I placed that dimension, this little feature came up. And as I hover over it, it brings me the ability to just write in stuff like three places. There's three of those holes. Um, cool. Nice and easy. Added two of those. And then can dimension this hole size as well, 5.5. .5. Go up two places. And I think that's pretty much everything that I care about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got pretty much everything that we need. Um, and I'll actually do the same thing here. I want this to be recorded at two places. And specifically looking at that face there, you know, the circuit, the actual circular part. Um, yeah, we've pretty much laid out our drawing exactly how we need it to be. We got just the dimensions we want to inspect, nothing else. Um, and really, I'm actually going to go one step further, and I'm going to say that we only really want to inspect the overall distance between these two holes. 
That's all I care about. And honestly, these I'm going to be drilling out and tapping. Don't care about those. And so, like, you can really go through and really make your not only your job in terms of setting up the inspection report easy, but also your inspector's job. You know, so that you don't have them measuring dimensions that they don't really don't really matter, right? Um, so we'll go through, yeah, just a couple of dimensions here that we want to measure. Um, this is one that we're going to drill out um, later on as well. So also don't care about that one. Nice and easy. Two dimensions, two, you know, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Nine, nine total characteristics. So let's make some balloons. Um, going to drop one there. Drop one there, there, there. Cool. So now I have a bunch of balloons. I'm going to start to say, all right, uh, let me just make sure. Balloon text, text, one. Cool. Balloon text, text, two. And again, this is just like a lot of, you know, going through, adding stuff in one by one, four, text, five. And this is also why it's important to leave a lot of space around your dimensions, make use of multiple views. Don't try to dimension everything all in one view. Um, I think I'll do something like that there, and this one can drop down. There we go. And you also kind of want to lay things out logically. I'm kind of going you know, view to view, left to right, and then coming down here. I should probably go left to right, down top to bottom. So we'll make this one text, six, seven, eight, and nine. Cool. So we have all of our balloons labeled now. Still don't particularly like these. Staggering them might help. It's a little bit clearer. All right, so we got our characteristics for that. And now what we can do, again, this is a multi-body part. We can do, um, ooh, actually, let me do that real quick. Um, new exploded view. Gonna move that down. Cool. Done. Uh, let's see if I can. Cool. Usually you can show. See, cool. So we have that. We also have a um, go over to the drawing. I can add an exploded view here. That's going to be helpful because I'm adding multiple parts in the same um, in the same drawing. So I'm going to show how these two go together. Um, I'm going to say that this is going to be. Configuration, default, show and exploded. Boom. It doesn't let me add explode lines. Cool. This will work. Let me really quickly double check. I'm just going to do a quick Google search to see if I can find SolidWorks. Hmm. Calmer outlines. Interesting.
I guess it's only at the assembly level, which is unfortunate. I love multi-body parts. Um, what I'll do instead is inside this drawing view, weird. Cool. So I can actually specify how high up my break is. Maybe. <laughs> so weird. What's it doing? Let's rebuild this whole thing real quick. Perfect. There we go. Um, all right. And what I'm also going to do here is I'm just going to add some um, some center lines or a center line here, just between these two. on those two. So that shows me you know, how these two parts go together. And now I can add some views. So look at, um, start with the front view here. Actually even better, I like going, I like starting from the, uh, Just the model view tab here, because that lets me pick my configuration really quickly. Locating block. Um, add that here. Um, really, all I care about in this case actually is this one. I want to do the bottom view. I just need to make sure that those holes are in the same positions as that piece there. And that's really it. Um, we'll probably also check the whole dimension on the inside here as well. Um, cool. That's pretty much it. All I need to do here, I'm just going to move this here. I'm going to add a note. It just tells me, hey, uh, locating block. Just going to put that right there. And we'll add some dimensions real quick. Just a quick one right there to there. Cool. I'm going to dimension this hole in three places. Cool. All right. Well, finally, we have our stuff set up. Just got to add uh, two more balloons. I'm just going to make sure this is text. But I don't have to keep editing it for each one. Cool. So in this case, our text needs to be 10. In this case, our text needs to be 11. And we have our drawing set up. Um, if I want it to be cool, I'll go in and edit my sheet format. Say blocking. Oh. Um, or this is leveling foot. FAI. All right, save this. Yes, update views. Always save your stuff. Leveling foot drawing, FAI. And we are all set. Now we can set up our characteristics. And for this, I'm going to move my SolidWorks window off to a separate screen. Um, but we'll pretty much just be working within, um, within the Excel. Actually, just to, uh, can I, is this even, no, best thing to do here, save this as a PDF. OK. 
Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and just minimize my SolidWorks window, open that piece up. It's in uh, VMS 2021 3D printing, chassis jig, got our FAI drawing right there. Going to split window this, hide some stuff, and zoom in. There we go. All right, so now what we can do is we can go through and we can add all of our characteristics. So characteristics number one, two, all the way down to 11. We'll turn it up to 11. We're gonna type reference locations for each ones. And this is kind of a little fun tip. If you never understood what these numbers and letters are for, they define a grid of locations. So in this case, we say characteristic uh, one is located in B4, uh, in B4. <laughs> um, B4 as well for characteristic two. From here, I can see characteristic six and uh, seven. If I was a little bit better, I'd go in and actually move these drawing views so that they, uh, We're in separate quadrants a little bit. Something like that. Let's save this out again. For that, I'm going to have to close that. Yes. Mm hmm. Discord's blowing up, I wonder why. Let's verify. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure it wasn't some, some issue related to the stream. All right, let's go back to our Excel FAI and zoom back in. The reason this guy is yellow is because it was attached to this line and the relation got broken. So just as a heads up there, um, shouldn't be yellow. But yeah, so we got our locations. Um, and actually, I'm just going to go through one at a time. So this needs to be 19.4. The unit is millimeters uh, plus tolerance. I don't really have, I don't have, don't have a plus tolerance. My minus tolerance is going to be uh, 0 0.4. And basically what that says is I'm already oversizing this hole. So I don't really want it to be any bigger than 19.4. If it's smaller all the way down to 19 millimeters, which is pretty much the size of the hole, um, you know, or pretty much the size of the bolt head, uh, or sorry, we're putting a nut in here, the size of the nut that's going in there. Um, you know, 19.4 millimeters needs to be you know, nine, you know, 19.4 plus zero or minus 0 0.4. Um, and so again, we're filling out just the characteristic side right now. So anything on this side is for when we actually print the part, do the inspection on it. So, um, now our next requirement. Oh, sorry, I actually did did the wrong one first. Uh, let me fix those borders real quick. Um, all right, so 4.0 units of millimeters plus tolerance, say 0 0.2 minus 0 0.2. Um, basically, give it a layer height um, of tolerance on that. You know, doesn't really need to be that much actually. In this case, I do want it to be four millimeters thick at least. So we'll do zero minus tolerance. Um, and some of that I can, you know, if this comes back as failed, then that means that the, uh, that I gotta go back in and redesign. Cool, so let's move on to characteristics three and four. These are both located in B3. Uh, for characteristic three, we're looking at 90 units of degrees plus tolerance uh, 0. 0.5 minus tolerance 0. 0.5. And then our characteristic of 32 is in millimeters. Yeah, that's a lot of like data entry, which is why the SolidWorks uh, inspection plugin, it automates all this stuff for you. It, you know, you put all your dimensions in your drawing, you click an auto balloon function, click generate report, fills in everything for you. You set your tolerances, you're all set. It's nice and you know, kosher. 
Um, but also understanding it from the manual side really helps out uh, too, just so that you know we can go through and, and we know what we're doing and or what the what the software is doing for us. Um, anyways, in this case, um, 32. I pretty much want it to be 32 you know, plus minus, let's say, uh, 0.5 millimeters. Seems like a you know want it to be pretty much right on 32 millimeters. All right, five. Uh, this is located in B2. Uh, this is going to be 5.1 millimeters. Um, that radius, I can't have any plus tolerance. I can only have a 0.1 minus tolerance on it. Um, comments uh, or additional details. Uh, actually, yeah. Yeah, so in this case, the inspector will uh, will list that they did in both places. If there was one that was in tolerance and one that was out of tolerance, they can specify that, um, oh, that kind of stuff. All right, let's go to characteristic six, finish up six and seven are both in A4. So let's do that real quick. And six is 23.0 millimeters. The other thing that I'll do, good practice is to make sure that all of your units are with the right uh, decimal point as well. Not that it particularly matters, but helps that a little bit. Um, you know, make sure that this matches up to what it shows on the drawing. Uh, cool. Plus tolerance on that, I'd say I'd be okay with like um some millimeter off you know actually a millimeter total so half half both ways <clears throat> and then 5.5 millimeters uh minus tolerance it's a five millimeter bolt so it can be five millimeters under and i don't really want it to be oversized too much play will be uh tough to tighten down so maybe i'll give it 0.1 millimeter oversized tolerance and characteristic eight what do we got we got that depth um this is located in oh it's kind of I put that in, I put that view in a in a bad spot um i'm going to say it's in b2 or a2 so our requirement here is that we need it to be um 9 millimeters um and plus tolerance i could probably have it over, like this doesn't really need to be that much, but I know that this is, or no, we're not printing along the layer lines here. So let's give it 0 0.2, 0 0.2. And actually, I don't even really care about that dimension that much. What was the one that I needed to be pretty accurate, I was saying? This one, I'll go down to 0 0.2. Same thing here, A2. Um, for that one, six millimeters. Um, I can't really have it be undersized in this case, but it can be oversized by probably like 0.4. And some of the stuff I'm like, I'm just setting stuff to it, you know, stuff that I'd be happy with. Like if I measure this with a caliper and, you know, printed this out and it was, you know, I specified 23 in my drawing, but it came out 23.2. Would I be like, would I be happy with it? Yeah, okay, I'd be happy with that. It's still sticking on my chassis jig. Um, which for some people, the bar on that isn't very high, but <laughs> um, you know, some people will stick almost anything on their chassis jig, no matter how good or bad it is. But, um, you know, or I'm not really trying to call anybody out here in particular. I'm just saying that, you know, just make sure that, you know, you're, you're kind of keeping in mind what's, you know, what's good enough for you and what's you know, probably not, you know, where, where do you draw the line and where should you draw the line as well? So it's millimeter for both of those. Um, plus tolerance, again, we're gonna match this up with this. So 0 0.5, 0 0.5. Um, and then this guy here, um, what are we looking at? Brain fart. <laughs> Yeah, 3.8. Um, I don't want this to be, actually, let me pull up that. Uh... No. Six screw dimensions. 
thread diameter, 0.13 inches. And what do we have as 0.13 times 25.4? So I have 3.30. So this is the, gonna be the diameter of our screw basically. Um, so 3.3, I wanna make sure that that 3.3 millimeter screw can actually fit in there. So minus 0.5 tolerance plus tolerance is zero. Don't want the screw to be too loose. All right, and that's it. I've set up my FAI. Um, at this point, basically I'd go through, print these parts. Uh, I can either digitally fill out this FAI. Um, well, actually, so I as a designer would fill this out. I'd send this off to my subsystem lead. Let's say that's Gary. Um, you know, Gary's gonna say, yep, I've approved it. I'm writing things in Gary's name right now, which is illegal. Um, <laughs> But then, uh, then let's say that I, you know, I send this off to to a print shop, or you know, maybe James on the team prints this off for me. I have him measure a bunch of stuff with calipers, um, and he says, "Yep, I measure. You know, I completed this FAI. I'm sending this back to you." Um, you know, James Barth goes and fills that out, um, and it's going to take a couple of days to print. So let's say this was done on 419, 2021, um, and then it's going to send it back um, to you know my subsystem lead. He's gonna look over the design and the manufacturing process and he's gonna say, yes, this FAI is approved or no, we actually need, um, no, we need further action. Um, yeah, we need further action. And I reviewed that on 421, 2021 based on judge feedback. They actually gave us some feedback on some stuff after our design presentation and we need some, you know, we need to improve some things. And that's it, we filled out our FAI. Um, Pretty straightforward. Um, and yeah, the biggest part, um, again, to remember or to remind ourselves, look at your drawing and think about where, or as you're doing your drawing, think about what you really care about being measured. Um, you know, we're, we're pretty trusting in the 3D printing process to give us relatively good shapes most of the time. You know, hey, you know, I'm, I'm gonna ask, to, you know, ask it to print the shape and it's gonna be pretty close. What stuff do I really need to check? Um, you know, overall shape, kind of hard to check. Um, fitment for a screw, really easy to check. Interaction between two parts, really easy to check. Uh, perpendicularity, stuff like that, where you're mounting stuff to two different faces, you want to measure the angle between them. Um, pretty easy to check and pretty important to check those things. It's important to check those things as they come off the print. Um, but a lot of things, like I said before, we're going to be drilling out you know, we're gonna be drilling and tapping those holes. I don't really need to care about what dimension they are because I know that if I tell it to print the size hole, it's probably gonna print a little undersized, which is why I'm drilling it out and tapping it. Um, same thing with the center hole for the, uh, for the screw clearance uh, for the main bolt. I'm gonna be drilling that out to half an inch later. I don't care what it comes off like off the printer. I'm gonna be making sure that it fits my screw uh, by hand later. Um, this case we're pressing something in it's a set dimension it can't be smaller than that set dimension but you also don't want it to be too loose to where you press it in it doesn't sit in there um to be fair we could use some like hot glue or something to hold these little laser level bubbles in there but that's beside the point um yeah and then it's a pretty straightforward process you fill out your part numbers all the stuff um fill out your characteristics <clears throat> Uh, make sure you have your reference locations. And you know, these are mostly for like really complicated drawings where you have tons and tons of stuff. Or let's say that I got a drawing from a manufacturer that had tons of drawings and I only wanted to inspect a couple of them. It's gonna be hard to find those balloons sometimes. So just giving you a little bit of a clue of like, hey, you know, it's in B4. Okay, so it's, in, it's gonna be in the top left section. That's the dimension that I'm looking for. Um, or again, this comes back and one of these things failed. All right, cool. Or do I got to look? All right, yeah, it's that dimension that failed. Okay, here's why that could be. Here's what changes I need to make as a designer. Um, with this template, I'm gonna make a couple of changes and then I'm gonna publish it on our PDM server. So anybody can go through and make FAI templates uh, or FAIs, um, strongly encourage you to do this just to verify that the part that you got, you know, whether I shipped it to you or handed it off to you or printed it for you is the part that you want um, and it will fit the requirements. So that's pretty much all there is to it. Um, yeah, there's, uh, I don't think, that, I didn't see any questions pop up in the chat. So um, if you're watching this after the fact and you want to, or if you have any questions for me, um, message me on Discord. 
um, message me on LinkedIn, whatever else. I'll have my LinkedIn down in the profile because that's probably going to be one of the more consistent ways. Um, yeah, um, happy to answer any questions for you guys on the team. That said, that's pretty much the end of this workshop. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. If you're watching this from the future, hello, future. Um, good luck out there making parts for 3D printing or for any other you know, sort of manufacturing purpose. Um, you know, take care of your FAIs. Uh, make sure that you get good parts and verify the parts that you machined. Um, that's all.